How's it going guys? Today we're going to take a look at the Darknet OPSEC Bible 2022 edition. This is the third year in a row that this particular user has posted and updated their Darknet OPSEC Bible on Dread, and there's obviously many other versions of this that exist both on the Darknet and on the clear web. But this one is really new and it's kind of popular on Dread, so I figured that we would just go through it together and I'll give you my thoughts on these different recommendations. So the first thing that they recommend is to buy a separate laptop just for the dark net. And they personally say that they recommend a lightweight Linux distro with UFW firewall enabled and to keep it updated daily. Now, I would say that getting a separate laptop for the dark net is going to be overkill for the vast majority of people that are using the dark net. But let's try to understand the reason why they would do this. And the best reason I can think of is they want to keep their darknet activity completely air-gapped from their clear web activity and any activity they're doing on the rest of their devices. And so having the separate laptop is a really good way to do that because even if that darknet laptop were to get hacked, there's really no way for it to affect your other devices as long as you are truly keeping it air-gapped, which means you don't want to use this darknet laptop when you're at home on your personal Wi-Fi because then if it's hacked, it could potentially pivot to start affecting your other devices. You obviously don't want to do any non-dark web activity on this machine, or at least nothing that can be traced back to you. Don't try to log into your personal YouTube account or your personal Facebook account with this darknet laptop. And don't even plug in your phone to this laptop to charge it or anything like that. Everything else should be kept separate from this laptop and you only use it on public Wi-Fi. But the reason that I say that that is probably overkill is because you can achieve about 98% of the same thing by just using Tails or Hunix instead. So Tails is a Linux distribution that runs off of a live USB. So nothing is actually getting installed to your computer. And once you shut the computer down and pull out that USB stick, there is no evidence that Tails was run on that computer left on it. And Tails also comes bundled with a bunch of other tools that this person talks about in their guide. Uh, so it keeps things simple, you know, Tails and Hunix. Oh, and Hunix, by the way, pretty much does the same thing, but instead of it running in a live non-persistent USB, it lets you spin up non-persistent virtual machines. So the moment you shut down that virtual machine, everything gets wiped out. It's as if you were never in it and you never did anything on it. Um, typically, Hunix requires a slightly stronger computer since you're doing virtualization on it. Uh, but if you have like a quad core, that should be good enough for running Hunix. So it's up to you what you do, but ultimately having the separate laptop is a little bit more secure potentially because uh, if that laptop gets compromised, like I said, then there's really no way for it to get traced back to you and as long as it's not on your Wi-Fi or anything like that. With Tails and Hunix, there is a possibility for something to go wrong, but in order for something to go wrong, uh, with Tails, for example, you would have to get some kind of malware on the computer that has root access on your computer because then it could mount other drives from your normal laptop and then start sort of spying on what your regular activity is. Like it could read from your documents, your pictures folder, for example. Uh, but again, it has to have root access and have a remote connection, which if that's happening, you've got a much bigger problem on your hands. And with Hunix, same thing, except it would also need to escape the KVM hypervisor. So that's gonna be even more difficult to do. And again, if this malware is getting on your computer, even if it's a separate laptop, then you've got a pretty big problem. Like all of your darknet stuff is gonna be compromised if somebody gets that level of access to the system. Then they recommend updating your operating system daily. So that's a good idea. Even if you're using Windows, you're not actually going on tour. Uh, then they recommend to install PGP software. So if you're using Tails or Hunix, you can skip this step because you're already gonna have the PGP software bundled with it. That's the great thing about using these distros that are meant for browsing Tor and being super anonymous. Um, now for 3A, they say that they recommend, they, they personally always use public Wi-Fi for placing orders and logging into darknet markets. 
and they say to just make sure that you aren't on camera. They go to the corners of the libraries, they look around for cameras, and then they tilt their screen so that it's hard for you to be seen. And then they go on to say that public Wi-Fi means your connections to the Tor market are only going to lead back to the public Wi-Fi network, much better uh, tracing back, much better than tracing back to your house. So using public Wi-Fi. Uh, again, it does provide a little bit of extra protection because ultimately it's not going to trace back to your real IP, but it can open up other issues, right? Uh, you might remember Dread Pirate Roberts, for example. He actually used public Wi-Fi only for administering the Silk Road, but he got caught in a library when the FBI did a sting on him. So if you're going to go in public with this laptop, I highly recommend that you have a hotkey to lock it and potentially even wipe it. I mean, generally you're going to have a hotkey to lock the computer uh, with most desktop environments, but you might even want one that's like an actual kill switch to try to wipe the drive of the computer. Definitely you want to keep it encrypted at the very least so that when it's locked, nobody can start pulling data off of it. Uh, and you're going to want to be able to do that very quickly. You don't want to have to look at your keyboard and figure out what keys it is. It's something you should be able to do like blindfolded really, really fast. And it's something that you should do at least locking the computer anytime it's going to go out of your sight or anytime your hands are going to be taken off of the laptop. Like with Dread Pirate Roberts, I'm pretty sure the way that the feds got him was they faked a domestic disturbance inside of the library and I think he might have gotten up to like go over and, and help or something like that. Or he might have just kind of like looked over like, oh, what's going on? That dude's smacking his wife. And then someone snatched the computer while he was still logged in and boom, they have access to everything. And I would also recommend putting a privacy screen filter over your laptop screen. So this is going to review, this is going to reduce the amount of viewing angles for it. So if somebody's standing over your shoulder, it's gonna be much harder for them to see what's going on on your screen. If there's any cameras, again, there's gonna be fewer angles that they're gonna be able to see your screen from. Uh, then they go on to talk about the Mac. Oh, one other thing uh, about the public Wi-Fi. So sort of a, a hybrid because uh, again, it, it's a little bit of overkill. Uh, you could probably get away with using Tor from your home. Uh, if you're, say, a political dissident and you're living in a country where Tor is illegal, you could also use bridges to obfuscate the fact that you're even using Tor. Uh, but if you want to get probably the best of both worlds, and this might not be possible depending on where you're living, but if you live in, say, an apartment building, you might be able to buy a long-range Yagi antenna and point it outside of your window or like point it off of your balcony towards a place that has public Wi-Fi and you might actually be able to pick up a signal from your home. So this way you've got the little bit of extra added protection, you know, nobody's gonna be in your home at least as long as your doors are locked and stuff like that um, and nobody else has the key. And yeah, that's probably the happy medium between using Tor from home and using public Wi-Fi. Uh, now for the MAC address randomization and the random host name, this is really only necessary if you're gonna be using public Wi-Fi's because anytime somebody goes into the administration panel of a router, they're able to see all the devices that are connected and they're able to see that MAC address and they're able to see that host name. So if you're going to different public Wi-Fi's, which is also what you should be doing if you go the public Wi-Fi route, um, then it could be possible to start tracing that. And especially if the police know, okay, every time this MAC address and every time this is showing up, something illegal is going on, we're going to set up a sting for this person because they go to, you know, maybe they rotate what Starbucks they go to. Um, you'd be surprised how many patterns will emerge even when you think you're being random. And speaking of randomness, so when you're setting the MAC address, that's just done through a program. So pretty good chance that you're gonna get a fairly random Mac there. But setting the host name is usually something that you're just making up off the top of your head. So you wanna make sure that what you're making up off the top of your head is actually random and that you're not uh, following some type of pattern or using words that's gonna make it easier to figure out who you are. Like if your host name is your first name, last name, that's probably not a very good host name to use. Uh, so now for number five, we're talking about getting some cryptocurrency now. So they say to obtain Bitcoin, 
Uh, and they talk about here that it doesn't even really matter what kind that you get or how you buy your Bitcoin because you're going to convert the Bitcoin to Monero. And they talk about some dark websites where you can do this. There's also unstoppableswap.net. So this is another uh, place that will let you use decentralized atomic swaps to swap your Bitcoin for Monero. And then once you get into Monero, you have all of the privacy that's guaranteed with that. Uh, so that it's a lot harder to trace what's going on. And then he says, after he converts his Bitcoin to XMR, if the IRS or government was to ask him about his Bitcoin holdings, because obviously, you know, the government's going to know that you have Bitcoin, especially if you're buying it from Coinbase or someplace like that. And then they're like, hey, man, what happened to your Bitcoin? Uh, and then he says, oh, I either donated it to various charities or lost the wallets. Don't say you donated it to charities because charities are going to probably just have one or two Bitcoin wallets. They'll ask you what charities it is. And especially if it's a lot of money, like if it's a thousand dollars, most people don't donate a thousand dollars to charity and then forget what charity it was they gave it to. Right. Unless you're some big time philanthropist. Um, so it's probably a better idea to just say that you lost all your Bitcoin in a boating accident. You had it on a flash drive and, you know, it fell out of your shorts when you went to go catch a catfish. There you go. <laughs> uh, once you have your, oh, and then he also says that he holds his Monero with Feather Wallet. Should be an okay wallet to use. Uh, I think wallets come with um, Tails and Hoonix though. So again, another cool reason to use those. Uh, but once you have your Monero and you're ready to buy some goods on the darknet markets, they tell you to find a real darknet market and find a highly rated vendor who's logged in recently. Uh, can't really give you any tips for that since I don't shop on darknet markets, but Dread is probably a good place to like figure out what places are legit and what ones aren't. Um, then when you're ready to order, PGP encrypt your shipping address using your real name and address to the vendors. PGP public key always encrypts your address on the device itself. Don't trust some third party uh, or online PGP encryptor. Yeah, definitely do it on the device yourself using a program, an offline program that you installed yourself. And then they tell you to uh, send the amount of XMR. So yeah, pay with Monero. Don't pay with Bitcoin or anything else. Uh, send the order and wait. Once your package is actually shipped, expect to receive your order in two to seven days. If your order hasn't arrived after being marked ship, after two weeks, private message your vendor asking for a status update. Uh, and then here they say, if you request the USPS tracking number, always have the vendor send you the tracking number encrypted with your public PGP key, and then check the tracking on third-party USPS tracking websites, such as Tracking More. And then they kind of go on this rant about, uh, don't ever check your USPS tracking with Tor because then that could flag your package for inspection. I, I actually kind of want to do this for all of my, I mean, again, I don't buy things off the dark web, but all of my like regular stuff that I buy from eBay, I kind of want to test this and start tracking my numbers on, uh, on Tor and see if uh, the cops show up when I go to pick it up from the PO box. But anyway, um, all, all of this stuff here, I wouldn't even really worry about it, okay? So in all honesty, you probably shouldn't even worry about tracking your darknet packages at all, okay? Don't even bother looking up the tracking number uh, because if the vendors aren't actually shipping you your stuff, then that's going to really affect their status. And as long as you picked a good vendor to begin with, you shouldn't really have to worry about this. Um, also, you know, I think a little bit can be said about the person who's buying uh, products from the dark web. If they're really fiending, they're like, oh, man, I got to check that tracking number. Got to see if my stuff's here. You know, what, what does that say about you? Maybe you should be seeking some help instead of uh, buying packs from the dark web. Uh, but, yeah, I wouldn't even worry about this because at the same time, if, if you're messaging your vendor like, hey man, where's my package? Hey man, where's your package? How do you know they're not gonna go open up U USPS and, and check it on tour themselves? There's nothing you can do from stopping them from doing that. You and the vendor both know what the tracking ID is. So this is one of those things where you probably just shouldn't worry about it. Don't even bother you know, checking your tracking number. But I guess if you have to, <laughs> then do it like a normal person and don't use Tor or a VPN. And um, this person also says to use the public Wi-Fi, which I guess is a good idea because if, if you check the package from um, your own Wi-Fi at home and 
you know, it's it's bugged in some way, then that kind of proves that you knew a package was coming to your house. So I, I guess in a way that's a good idea, but the even better idea is just don't even worry about it. Uh, then number 10, once your order arrives, burn or throw away the package and get the package out of your house as fast as you can. I also recommend opening orders outside of your house in case there is a tracking device which activates when you open the package. And he recommends to open it up uh, in a public bathroom, and then that way if there's a tracking device, you can flush it down the toilet. Okay, so at this point, we've stepped into tinfoil territory. So go get your tinfoil, kids, and you want to first create a hat. Create a nice comfy hat out of tinfoil and put it on your head. But don't put the tinfoil away yet, because now we have to wrap the packages in tinfoil. We have to wrap them in multiple layers of tinfoil, because tinfoil... Uh, can block most radio waves. Radio waves, LTE, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all of that stuff gets blocked with tinfoil. So if you're worried about tracking devices in your packages, for one, you're probably screwed anyway if tracking devices are being mailed to you, but you can disable them by just putting them in tinfoil. Um, in this case, this guy is saying that he's worried about it activating once you open the package, but in all honesty, a tracking device they can go for weeks and weeks, maybe even months, depending on what kind of battery you connect to it. Uh, and you could also have the tracking device set up in a more clever way than to just activate when it's opened. You could have it activate whenever the package is moved. That's the really smart way to set up a tracking device because obviously when the package is still, you know where it is. You can just take the last ping that came from it. Uh, and then when it's moving, when it's on the go, you can see where it's going. And they could also track you leaving your house and going to the public restroom. And if they've sent you multiple tracking devices, if they're recognizing a pattern, then they get you on your way out of the house with a tracking device. Uh, but again, tracking devices, probably not a huge thing to worry about anyway. Uh, if, if you get a tracking device, it means you either ordered from a honeypot or whatever vendor you're working with is actually a Fed who's, or they're working with the Feds. You could even take the tinfoil approach a step further and you could clear out a small closet and tinfoil an entire room. And then you could keep your Amazon packages, you could keep your eBay packages and your Tarknet packages all in there and then you can just act like it's totally normal. You're, you're, you're not doing anything illegal. You're just a crazy person that thinks that, I don't know, Jeff Bezos is trying to track you. So you put all your packages in a room. That's your excuse for doing it. Uh, that's probably better than taking it into public and opening it in a bathroom. Uh, but one thing that is valid is uh, like this paragraph here where they talk about how the FBI, they oftentimes will look for packaging materials to try and track this kind of activity. So it definitely is a good idea to destroy the packaging materials as soon as you can. Uh, I would recommend burning them. Uh, this guy, he says that he burns them and like, um, yeah, here he says he takes an empty package to a burn pit at his local beach and he soaks in lighter fluid, but he's burning it in public uh, or he's throwing them away in public trash cans. I wouldn't really recommend doing that. Like just burn it at your house. Um, maybe you don't have a burn pit per se, but just burn it on the grill. You know, there's there, there's lots of ways you could get rid of it there. Uh, and then if you don't have even that, if you're like, I don't know, somebody living in a New York studio apartment, well, if that's the case, you should probably have different priorities than buying packs from the dark web. <laughs> but yeah, don't throw, throw it away in, in public and that's just a risk that doesn't seem necessary. Uh, don't tell your friends about your darknet usage at all in any way. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Yeah, don't talk about the dark web and darknet in public. Uh, and then if you need to talk about darknet usage, talk about it on Dread. Yeah, talk about it on other darknet forums, but obviously don't give away any of your public information because then people can trace you back to where you are. You have to assume on forums like this that there's lots and lots of feds that are reading and archiving every single post. Okay, so number 12, we're gonna imagine getting raided by the police. What evidence would be found? Empty packages from your vendor? No, because you got rid of all of those. Uh, bookmarks, save darknet market URLs on your desktop or in a text file? Uh, no, and this person says because they load a series of onion sites that give them the addresses to uh, their darknet markets. Now, the problem with doing this is if those onion indexing sites were to be compromised, they could swap out the legitimate 
a forum or wherever you're going on the dark web with a place that's a honeypot because it's really easy to clone a website. You can literally just download all the assets with HTT track and then boom, you can spin up your own version of it. So what might be a better option is to have a text file, give it some kind of innocuous name and then encrypt it and make sure you use a nice big uh, password. Uh, you could even use KeePass XC, like KeePass uh, or KeePass, whatever version of KeePass, because they have um, a notes section in the database where usually you leave information about whatever credentials are there, but you could actually just put the URL for the darknet market. And actually there's a separate field for the um, URL as well. And then you could put your credentials there and then that's gonna be encrypted. So that way there's no way to get it as long as uh, you know someone doesn't beat it out of you with a monkey wrench. Uh, and then let's see, yeah, you're not gonna keep any rugs in your dresser and anything like that. Uh, and then we're not gonna talk about rugs with your cell phone. Well, actually, yeah. So with the cell phone, you don't want cell phones to really be around any of this activity, okay? If, if you're suspected, and especially if you're a if you specifically are suspected of something and police are able to tap your phones and things like that, uh, then they can look at things through the camera. They could listen to things through the microphone. So you want to keep the phone completely away from all of this activity and don't talk around it or anything like that. And then for number 14, encrypt your hard drive and your solid state disk. Yes, definitely encrypt the drive use a strong password to secure it, and also don't have it set up so that it can be decrypted with just biometrics because at least here in the US, and I would assume in most other countries as well, the police are able to subpoena your biometric information. So they can, um, you know, they can get a warrant for your fingerprint, they can get a warrant to scan your face, all sorts of things like that. So you gotta make sure that it's a password, uh, maybe even a combination of a password and a Yubi key or something like that in order to unlock the hard drive. And same thing goes for your database with KeePass XC. And then he starts getting into advice for vendors, but that's going to get way into the territory of things we can't talk about on YouTube. Um, I think that this guide was pretty good. Obviously, there were a lot of areas where I disagreed and have uh, other recommendations for what you could do. But let me know in the comments section what you guys thought about this. Share it and like it to hack the algorithm. Follow me on Odyssey and have a great day.